From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ready with your call to Hartford, Mr. Dollar. Go ahead, please. Johnny, what's up? Plenty, Dave. The Wells girl was right. Her father was murdered. We just got the autopsy report. He died from a dose of ground glass. Then I'll put a stop order on the insurance claim. It was filed this afternoon. And something else, Dave. A man died in St. Louis about two and a half years ago. I wonder if you'd have mutual records service check and see if he was insured. His name was Walter Maberly Burke. Burke? Well, Johnny, that's... Yeah, I know. Jonathan Wells' widow was previously married to Burke. They were married at the time of his death. And he also died suddenly and mysteriously. Holy smoke. Just call her murdering Mabel. Oh, you haven't met her, Dave. She's just a sweet old lady who's had a little bad luck now and then. And she regards death as the doorway to a greater and more glorious life. Oh? Well, that sounds very noble. It would. If she didn't keep slamming the door. Tonight... And every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Chicago, to the home office, Northwestern Surety Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lonely Hearts Matter. Expense account continued. Item 8, $7.65, dinner for Norma Wells and myself. It was brought up by room service and we ate alone in my suite. Norma didn't feel like facing the dining room. I was still trying to figure her out. When she'd come to me with a claim that her father had been poisoned by her stepmother for his insurance, I'd tagged her for a jealous, hysterical kid. And that still went. But now, with the autopsy report in, it was more than that. She was right. Jonathan Wells had been poisoned. And again, when she told me someone was hanging around her apartment, I only half believed her. But by now, I was about ready to believe anything. I'd have sworn I couldn't eat a bite. Well, you needed it. You've been going on nothing but nerve. And I'll still be. Until this is all over. Well, it shouldn't take long now. That autopsy report gives us the green light. The police will move in now, and we can put the pressure on. It's it's such a terrible thing. Why, why six months ago, when she married him, she was planning this right then. It looks that way, all right. Father was always so good to her. And yes, and to that worthless nephew of hers, Burton Creeley. What kind of a mind does a person have, Mr. Dollar? To do a thing like she did. Well, it hasn't been proved yet that she's the one who did it, Miss Wells. No, but who else could have? I don't know. More coffee? No, thanks. Well, whenever you're finished, we'll take a taxi over to your apartment and pick up whatever you need and then get you a room here at the hotel. I don't think you're in danger, but I imagine you'll feel a lot less nervous here. Oh, I will. And, and I do appreciate your, your help and kindness, Mr. Dollar. Forget it. It's part of my job. Only this time, when you check in, you go to your room and stay put. What do you mean? When I came back from talking to Mabel Burke, Max Lancer from the DA's office was waiting for me down in the lobby. He said he'd phoned here to the room five or six times, got no answer. I was here. I, I heard the phone, but well, I didn't know if, if you wanted me to answer. He sent a bellboy up to knock on the door. Well, I, I must have been in the shower. I was here all the time. Don't you believe me? Any reason I shouldn't believe you? Are you through eating? Yes. Okay, let's go. Expense account item nine, a dollar and eighty cents. Taxi from the hotel to Norma Wells' apartment. Night had fallen over the city and the tall buildings of the loop shimmered above the noisy blaze of lights. Laughing groups of early dinner goers jostled through the scrambling packs of late shoppers. Auto horns, blaring jazz, newsboys, traffic whistles. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Yesterday never was. Tomorrow's only a dream, and today's nearly gone. So hurry it up and let's get going. We'll sleep when we're dead. Like Jonathan Wells on his cool marble slab in the city morgue. It's apartment C, the next door on the left. Right. <laughs> Have a key here somewhere. Sure you locked it? Oh, yes, I always... It's not locked. Well, you were scared when you left, and maybe you No. Did. I remember locking the door. You sure? Yes. Now it's... Stay some... back. Oh. 
What is it, Mr. Dollar? Come on in. Oh. Oh, no. Yeah, it looks as though you've had visitors, Miss Wells. The whole place turned upside down. Why would anyone want to do that? Looking for something, probably. For what? I don't know. Suppose you look around, see if you notice anything missing. It's no use, Mr. Dollar. I've gone through the whole place twice now, and I'm certain that nothing's been taken. But they had to have some reason to break in here, go through everything this way. I suppose so, but... Well, I'm positive there's nothing missing. All right. If there isn't, there isn't. Well, do you suppose that coffee's ready now? Oh, I think so. Come on in the kitchen. I guess you'll believe me now. Somebody was hanging around here earlier today. Mm. Just wish I could figure what they're after. Hmm. Looks plenty strong. There's sugar there on the table. I'll get some cream from the refrigerator. Don't bother on my account. I drink it black. Well, not me. I use plenty of both. Lots and lots of cream and... Two heaping spoons of sugar. Well, they must have had a reason to break in here. If it wasn't to steal something, then what was the reason? The sugar looks funny. Doesn't make sense at all. I guess I ought to keep it covered. Hmm. The sugar. I was saying it looked funny. Well... Wait a minute. Maybe they broke in to leave something. Leave something? Yeah. Here. Give me that cup. And the spoon. What are you doing? Look. That's funny. It didn't even dissolve. The sugar dissolved, all right. Well, then what's that in the spoon? Brown glass. I phoned Max Lancer and had him send over a policewoman to accompany Norma Wells back to the hotel, get her checked in, and stay with her overnight. Then I called the Wells residence. The old lady answered the phone herself, and I asked for her nephew, Burton Creeley. She said he wasn't in. So on an off chance, I took a taxi to the office of the Rendezvous Club, Lonely Hearts Unlimited. There was no light showing behind the transom over the door. The door was unlocked. I fumbled around for a light switch, but somebody beat me to it. Get your hands up! Well, at least I found you in this time. What are you doing here? Who are you? Put that gun away, Creeley. Or if you're going to use it, you'd better take the safety off first. Safety? What are you doing? <laughs> All right, let go of it, Creeley. Thanks. You think you'll get away with this, mister? You're crazy. Mm, my mistake. The safety was off. Sorry to rough you up, but I don't like people who go around pointing guns at people without any reason for it. You broke in here. That's illegal entry. I'll have you arrested. Why not? Why not? The phone's right behind you. Who are you, anyway? Johnny Dollar. I'm a special investigator for the Northwestern Surety Company. What? I imagine the name is familiar to you, since they're holding a $50,000 life insurance policy on the late Jonathan Wells, with your Aunt Mabel named as beneficiary. What are you doing here? Looking for you, as a matter of fact. What for? I wanted to ask you why you sneaked out through the door there the other day in the office when I was here earlier. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, knock it off, Creeley. You got in such a hurry, you left your cigar burning there in the ashtray, the same brand you're smoking right now. Well, I... I, I thought you were a bill collector. You knew who I was. You were listening there at the door while I talked to your secretary. Now, why'd you run out? Oh, all right, all right. I did know who you were, Mr. Dollar, but... Well, you're misinterpreting things. No kidding. In what way? I was late for an appointment. I, I didn't want to get tied up. I figured you could find out anything you wanted to know from my aunt. I, I, I saw no necessity for talking to you. I see. Where have you been since then? Right here, most of the time. And the rest of the time? Well, what difference does it make? You weren't over at Norma Wells' apartment by any chance. <laughs> Are you kidding? I detest that girl. Why so? Because she's a smug, self-satisfied little phony. She's too big for a britches. What makes you think I'd be hanging around her? Somebody was. I don't get it. Somebody broke into her apartment this afternoon or this evening and turned it upside down. She hasn't got anything I want. They didn't take anything. They broke in to leave something. I found some ground glass planted in her sugar bowl. Ground glass? Sound familiar? What are you getting at? You mean you haven't heard about the coroner's report on Jonathan Wells? No, why? What has that got to Mr. do with... Mr. Wells died from a dose of ground glass. You mean he was killed, murdered? I don't imagine he ate the stuff intentionally, do you? Again, 
believe her. Uh, well, the police aren't having that trouble. I just can't imagine anybody. He's such a nice guy. He always got along fine with everybody. Including you? Yes. We got to be good friends. What about his daughter, Norma? I don't really know. She blew her top and moved out a month after Aunt Mabel and Jonathan were married. Why? Jealous, I guess. She couldn't stand it to see her father pay any attention to anybody but her. Did they quarrel much? Jonathan never quarreled with anybody. No, she just seemed to go around with a mad on most of the time. She's a rare one, that girl. What do you mean? Oh, she seems to think of herself as a princess or something. I understand you made quite a play for her at first. I suppose she told you that. Did you? I tried to be friendly to her, that's all. I, I don't know what she chose to call it. Mr. Dollar, I'm engaged to Miss Tetler, the girl that works here in the office. Mm -hmm. What do you do for a living, Mr. Creeley? Oh, I take care of this correspondence club for Aunt Mabel. I've got sort of a heart condition. I can't work too hard. I see. You know, it might be a good idea if you checked in with the police. They'll probably want to talk to you. Well, who do they think did it? Well, they haven't arrested anybody yet, but there are a lot of straws pointing in one direction. What direction? Towards your Aunt Mabel, I'm afraid. But that's ridiculous. Now, she may be a little vague, not quite all with it, maybe, but she wouldn't do a thing like that. They're out to frame her. That's what they're doing. Who else had a motive, Mr. Creeley? But what about his daughter? She stands to gain by all this. She inherits the estate. Maybe she faked that burglary, planted the ground glass in her apartment herself. Have you thought of that, Mr. Dollar? Yeah. Yeah, I've thought of it. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, another murder comes to light, another link in a long chain, and an old lady weeps for the wasted years. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>